1934 to 19. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, well, repeating myself, uh, my name is Reverend Dr. Friendly C. Campbell. I've been to, lived through three periods of racism in 1934 to 1956, the period of segregation. Actually, 1965, when segregation was finally eliminated. The brief moment of a move toward racial integration that lasted maybe about six years before the Black Power agents of the ruling class struck and then pushed it back from racial integration to, to racial desegregation. And now living through the period of the new racism, neo-racism, the new Jim Crow, more broadly defined. So I've covered a quite a bit in my uh, life with this work. We're looking to create an alternative proposal to the eighth principle. Everybody says, well, if you don't like to propose eighth principle, what would you propose? I said, well, okay, we'll talk about that. And my co-partner is uh, my brother, Kelvin Sandridge, combination of friend, men a mentee, apprentice, running buddy, <laughs> partner in crime in many ways. Uh, I knew him when, and he knew me when, and he'll be sharing his own thoughts. And uh, rather than, uh, as we stated, Reverend Todd Eklough, Kelvin, give us a brief biographical sketch of yourself, who you are, and then we'll start our question and answer interview. We decided to use that technique. Uh, my brother, say a few words about who you are and where you came from. All right. Uh, my name is Kelvin Sandridge. Uh, I came, uh, lived, born in Chicago on the south side <laughs> in the beautiful Washington Park homes. One of the projects on the south side that was cluttered with crime and, and no individual privacy. Um, it was uh, a mess. And when we were growing up, I remember being, we remember being so poor until we had nothing to eat. I mean, this is a particular thing I wanted to share with you all. Um, we were really hungry and, you know, the human spirit continues to push on. So every once in a while, we would just get up and go to the uh, cabinets and see if there was something. And then finally, it came to me as like, wait a minute, we have flour, we have cornmeal, we have sugar. What can I do with that? So I said, hmm, when you boil water, the flour gets very thick. Let me try this. So I mixed the three ingredients together and poured boiling water on it, and it became a paste. And uh, as it was pasty, it kind of smelled pretty good. So I said, I wonder what would happen if we fry it. So we fried it and uh, it became a meal of very, very heavy hot cakes. And um, boy, it helped us to survive because when you have absolutely nothing but that, you become innovative and, uh, and something comes up. So we had uh, hot cakes uh, that were filled with, uh, uh, what do you call those carbs? And, uh, but it really helped us to survive. But I also realized at that time, a little later that it was not just black people suffering from hunger, but it was black white people suffering from hunger too. Back in the seventies, it was a horrible time to be really poor because they had no mercy on you and everything that they gave you such as food stamps was always never enough. And um, you can believe that that would be sometimes almost up to a week when you would have nothing to eat. And um, I remember these stories because it is such a nightmare even for me today when I think about it, how in the world did we survive? It's, it's crazy, but I just wanted to share that much. And go ahead, Dr. Campbell. All right. Well, a couple more questions for you before we get into the whole discussion, because this is a framework. Now, here, I'm, I'm a part of the Talented Tenth. I never knew anything about hunger at all. Uh, living in South Carolina and Anderson, we were a part of the Black folks on the Hill. And we never had any 
direct relationship with the people way down in the, in the valley part. We did have friends at the, what we call the mid, mid side. But historically speaking, uh, Kelvin and I would be in separate worlds, absolutely separate worlds. And yet, through the power of the teleological imperative, my name for God, we're now comrades in the struggle. Before we proceed, could you say a few words about how you got involved with UUism, uh, the, the New Orleans experience? As well, we um, talk about this proposed eighth principle. Well, I uh, was invited to come to your church. And when I did, I sat there and I'm like, my God, this is the ideal place. No crazy, you're going to go to hell stuff. No, no craziness on the, or the, or the uh, alternative lifestyle that you have to give up everything. And, um, and because God required it and no crazy shoutings, foaming at the mouths, uh, screaming in tongues that you can't understand. And that was the black church for me, which was a nightmare. And um, all of the threats of God hating you or will come at you or may make a brick fall from the sky and hit you in the head. These were the actual things that I heard. Those are the actual things that brought to me great depression and, and such a mess of, of uh, trying, to, trying to find peace. So when I came to the church, I was, I was really amazed at the peace that I found at that place. And I really enjoyed every second of being there. Um, we went to New Orleans for, for the, uh, what was the convocation? Yeah, the uh, GA20 something. Yeah. And uh, we were uh, fighting against the, uh, the eighth principle that makes white people feel guilty even though some of them may have never ever raised a racist hand against anyone, but they were still made to feel guilty for being white, basically. So we, we struggled with the people and, and my experience was the white people that I spoke to were so happy to know that someone black particularly understood what they were going through and that they didn't want to be accused of being something that they were not. A lot of them were not racist. So I would approach them and I told them, you're not racist. You're my brothers and you're my sisters and you, you, and that's the way it should be. And that's the way it ought to be forever. But instead, this whole thing about the eighth principle that wants to subject white people to a lot of the same judgments and the mess that black people went through is wrong. And I just, I still can't stand it. And I think it's uh, unjust and, but I love the church, I really do. And I hope that it could continue to be a place where I can find peace. All right. Well, we've said enough about what it says. So let's take a look at what it is. it reads like. So let me begin by reading the existing wording of the proposed eighth principle. By the way, Kelvin is also the co-chair of our Chicago area chapter of UMEAC. So far, the only chapter in the entire United States, but hopefully as a result of this convocation, we'll have more chapters. Here's what the proposed eighth principle says. And if you listen to it, it sounds quite seemingly reasonable. We the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association covenant to affirm and promote journeying toward spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. So as you hear those words, uh, Kelvin, do you see any connection with how that would help with the black and brown neo-racist politicians that control a lot of Chicago? Do you have any opinions about that? Well, with uh, what's happening in, in Chicago between blacks and, and Hispanics, and uh, is a lot of, uh, it started to me with the Republican Party 
who would try to separate us by saying things like, actually, Latinos love their families and they love to work, thereby implying that Black people don't love their families or love to work. And it started to work where a lot of Latinos and Blacks were starting to become separate. I've heard it on radio stations and I, I called in to one radio station, WVON, that was pretty uh, uh, renowned for his speech and uh, uh, allowing people to speak in Chicago. And they were talking so much against uh, Mexicans until it became disgusting. So I called him up and I said, uh, you all are wrong for doing that. And you know that you're wrong and what we should be doing is trying to unite to fight back this situation that's making us fight each other. And um, now you have, uh, you have uh, people trying to unite, but there's always an element of something that's trying to break us apart. Well, that is what uh, the eighth principle is not designed to do. It is not designed to fight the kind of neo-racism you're describing, where these black and brown politicians get up and fight for the money, fight for the power, fight for the control, but in the end, leaving the average black, white, and Latino person in the lurch, like uh, the mayor. So they don't want to fight against that kind of thing. All they want to do is have something called spiritual wholeness rather than political or economic struggles. That doesn't even appear uh, in the language. They, it's about spiritual wholeness rather than about specifically social justice. Uh, so spiritual wholeness, you mentioned a little bit about the religious uh, environment that you went to and you were sort of uh, describing how it was very oppressive to you. So I guess you could say that this spiritual wholeness stuff for you bit the spiritual church of God and Christ and that kind of thing, which by the mm -hmm. way is some of the stuff that the proponents of the uh, eighth proposed eighth principle push that black people got a, a spirituality that's more in tune with the nature of things and that kind of stuff. So the spiritual wholeness stuff uh, can, as, as you described it, could have driven you, you crazy. Uh, when you hear the term multicultural, what, is the, what do you think it means? Multicultural, uh, it, it means to me uh, not necessarily anti-racism, but uh, a societal thing where, where cultures are to meet, greet, not necessarily uh, join together as a tradition or... or, or a way of exchange, but denying denying what racism really is and the, how to resolve that issue. All right, well, that, like you say, that, that's when you hear that word, that's what you think it means. But when the members of the proposed eighth principle use the word multicultural, they mean anti-white. Why do I say this? I have worked with the in the old days, I was a supporter of drum. I worked with people in the ARE in the good old days when we were allowed to have freedom of participation in the UUA. And uh, they made it very clear, you know, kind of a friendly sort of way that when they said multicultural, like drum, which is one of the proponents of this new so-called eighth principle, it's called diverse, revolutionary, unitarian, universalist, multicultural ministries. Well, when I went to one of their meetings, I saw nothing but um, minorities in there. I said, well, where's the white members? They said, well, multicultural doesn't apply to them. They have their own separate organization called Allies for Racial Equity. So I asked one of the leaders of ARE, well, why don't you allow white, uh, why, why don't you are not allowed to be a part of DRUM? And he gave me uh, three possible answers. One, white people really don't have any culture. They are kind of a mongrel uh, racial cultural group. Uh, then he said, well, secondly, uh, it makes uh, people of color feel uncomfortable to have white people participating in the movement like it was with old black power nonsense. And thirdly, he said, a white culture is inherently oppressive, Eurocentric, dominating, competitive, and all kinds of other nasty things. So though, though your definition of multicultural means people of all cultures, 
their definition of multicultural strictly means uh, no whites allowed. And it's right, in fact, they, they call it decentering whiteness and that kind of thing. And certainly you talk about spiritual wholeness. I don't say you can have spiritual wholeness by excluding a group of people because of their racial heritage. So that's what we got to look at with this, this thing. Um, you were once, uh, now when you hear the concept of beloved community, uh, you know, we, that's not a word that sounds pretty good. Like with unions. Unions could be considered a kind of a beloved community. Uh, by the way, what kind of unions were you in when you were working on strikes and things like that? I was part of the local 743 and also local 73 teachers uh, assistance unit. And uh, uh, you can call it a beloved community, but a beloved community like that tend to forget certain uh, workers and uh, it became somewhat of a, well, they were mean, not necessarily considerate, but mean. Well, so we have all kinds of potential forms of the beloved community, unions, churches of various kinds, neighborhood communities. But you, you can't say that this beloved community can be seen as an activist reality uh, in terms of broad economic issues. And so when I hear the term beloved community, I'm thinking of a future. Now, I haven't come out of a Marxist-Leninist historical theist tradition. And for me, the beloved community cannot take place until you have a classless society. And so under imperialism, like we are today, uh, we cannot have a beloved community. You can have, have uh, people who are in beloved relationship, but the idea of a beloved community being created under the present conditions of US, NATO, Ukrainian, Russian conflict is uh, literally a pipe dream and it, it distorts what it means. So, so what they're fighting for is absolutely unrealistic. Okay, so uh, dismantling racism and other oppressions. What do you think about that? Mm, dismantling racism. It's just like the United States said that they would end racism. And I uh, thought about the details or, or what it would take to end <laughs> racism, dismantling it means the change of, of the society as a whole, but that could not and would not take place under capitalism, it cannot afford to. Well, that was, uh, we did, you could have said that when we fought the Klan and the Nazis in the Chicago area back in the uh, 70s and 80s, yeah. uh, that we were trying to dismantle racism. Did you ever take part in any of those dismantling racism fights? Yes, in, yes uh, I did. Marquette Parker, Joliet? Mm -hmm. uh, could you share real quickly one of those uh, one of those dismantling efforts we took part in? Sure. Well, we uh, the, the Nazis were marching in, um, uh, I believe, in Evanston, and uh, so we all got there and we gathered as the Nazis were at the forefront with their uh, with their Nazi uniforms on, shouting all this anti-Jewish, anti-Black stuff. And uh, so we, we were barred, but we tried our best to break through the uh, barriers to, to get to them. Uh, but the barriers were pretty great, but we still have fun with the flying rocks and, uh, and, soap, and things. Soap bars. <laughs> <laughs> throwing, throwing those soap bars. <laughs> right, right. So, so our I, aim was our aim was pretty good, and that we we basically disturbed uh, their intent and to uh, spread racism. Then and it it was it was fun. It was good, and it was fun, and it was a great lesson learned by many people who were there observing us. There you go. And so if you want to do some that dismantling racism, that's what it looked like. We were there: black, brown, red, and yellow, white. Well, mainly black, brown, and white. Uh, mm -hmm. working together in multi-racial right. unity to uh, do some stuff like that. So that Many was, people uh, were afraid that you could not fight the Klan or the Nazis because of their past uh, histories. But when they saw us fighting them, they were encouraged. That's right. 
And one of the things that uh, I remember from that uh, struggle, where well, there were a group called the Ukrainian Nazis. These were uh, from the place in, you, in Marquette Park, a place called Ukrainian Village. And a lot mm -hmm. of uh, Ukrainian Nazis were brought over there from uh, World War II and settled in Marquette Park. And so there we are marching in Marquette Park with real old time Nazis from the good old days, mm -hmm. unable to stop us because we were fully multiracial. And, so and willing to fight. Racism, you got to come in a multiracial way to do it. Otherwise, right. you're, you're playing games and their multicultural approach will collapse. Right. All right, we have criticized this proposed eighth principle enough. There'll be further discussions about it later on by Todd and uh, and uh, my brother, uh, 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 brother Craig. So here is how I would like to propose that everybody keeps saying, "Oh, you guys are so negative. You're so negative." If you don't like to propose a principle, what wording would you have? Now we know that they would not allow not one change in the eighth principle, uh, proposed eighth principle. They, they treat it like the Bible worshipers. You cannot change one iota. You change one iota, then you're going to be in trouble. So I don't know if Brother Trudeau has got it on his screen. Uh, could you uh, put that up for us? Just a minute. All right, I'll read it to give it a certain sonority. We, the members of the United Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations, covenant to affirm and promote journeying toward a religious understanding of our place in the universe by building a multiracial, multicultural, including all cultures, beloved community seen as a future historical reality by our actions as individuals committed to the seven principles who will be accountable to each other as we seek through heroic struggles to one day dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. If we do not see this as a eighth principle, we simply see it as a call to action. That's why we say, based upon our seven principles, to make it clear, this would, this would not be an eighth principle, a proposed eighth principle, would be considered like a call to action. But how does that sound, Kelvin? Kelvin, are you there? Have I lost you? All right. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that sounds great. That's right. So, so that's, that's just how we would, would handle this, the contradiction. We say, look, you have some a few good ideas in your your proposed eighth principle. Well, let's don't call it a principle. It doesn't sound like a principle. Is that really a principle? And it certainly doesn't reflect how other principles are put together. But as a call to action to deal with the essential problem of holding back social change in the world <laughs> and social change in the Ukraine and in Russia and places like that a vision of fighting racism to eventually dismantle it and, and the idea of being accountable because in the proposed age principle, we're gonna be accountable to uh, black people uh, in your congregation or if you can't find any black people in your congregation, you gotta dig up some and then you're accountable to them and they'll determine whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong. We wanna be accountable to each other. So that's how we see it. And so now let's throw it open to the uh, audience to the brothers and sisters here and see what they think about our alternative wording. Did I lose myself? I'm, I keep losing my screen. The, All uh, right. To try to keep order here, if, if people could use the raise hand button at the bottom, that'll move your window right to the front and it makes a yellow hand in, in your window and that then Finley or Kelvin can call on whoever uh, is in order. Go ahead, Alan. Kelvin, can I have you be handling calling people because I've got to take my pills. Sure, but I can't see anyone because the wording is still on the screen. Oh. Yeah, you have to leave. Oh, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Sure, I can help. I thought I saw Alan Lindrup. Yeah. Okay, uh, 
Yeah, I, I think as a, an action statement, I think your statement is good. Uh, I think if we were having to have something within the, the current structure of uh, principles, I would have what a uh, proper wording would simply be, you know, the, we affirm and promote is what's there already to start. So it'd be just to affirm and promote ending racism and other oppressions, period. And that would be, you know, like affirming the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Short and sweet, what our goal is, what we affirm as an objective and leave it at that. And that would be something that would be at least consistent in structure with the other principles and something I think we could get behind, not the crazy wording that has been proposed. So. Okay. Anyone else? You're not, you got to unmute. Okay. I agree with Alan that it should be much shorter. If you look at the other, the, the seven principles, they're very short. And the, the most important thing about them is anybody who reads one of the seven principles knows what they mean. And that's what I, what I really dislike about the proposed eighth principle is that it, it includes a lot of critical race jargon that no only the in group understands. Whereas I think that. I like yours, uh, Finley, because it, anybody could understand it and it's only just using plain English. But I, I would like it to be shorter and uh, like and like Ellen said, just a few simple words. That's what I think. Okay. Anyone else? Or like I said. Yeah, we got Karen next, really, and then and then Dick. And if yeah, I don't have a full screen, so I'll, okay, I'm, I'm, well, I can call on. Let's go with Karen next. Okay, yeah, you you do that. I don't see anybody but me. Hi, um, I think those are all great suggestions, and I applaud um, your your uh, effort to perform to put forth something. Um, that's that's a great idea. Um, Certainly shorter, I think accountable is a tricky word and also accountable to one another. In UU tradition, we are accountable to our conscience. And um, so I'm not, I'm not sure what it means accountable to one another, but that's, I'm just putting forth that that could be a little tricky. Fundamentally, we are accountable to ourselves as I see it and as the history of you, you has been as I understand it. Uh, let me uh, respond to that. Uh, there, there's a, there are two histories of Unitarian Universalism, which our journey <laughs> on the long straight trip reveals. One is collective reality, uh, uh, the right of conscience and the democratic process. So they're not uh, the democratic parts process is where the community comes in and the right of conscience where individuality comes in. But always it has been in Unitarian Universalist uh, his theological history, the sense first we were accountable to God for, for up until 1961. So we had a very clear <laughs> accountability persona, persona uh, either God as a, as a, a broad force of universal love or Jesus as an adopted son of God, which was the old Aryan philosophy, or Jesus as a very wise and incredibly powerful human being, which was the Socinian side. So we never have been individualistic by in and of itself prior to 1961. After 1961, when we decided to take the God thing out of our accountability system, then there was one group that said, well, I'm only accountable to my conscience, which is anarchy, if you think about it, because that means your conscience might be against my conscience and then we get nothing done. And so we balanced it out in the, uh, in the fifth principle, right of conscience, that's your individuality, but democratic process, that's the collective side. So you can't slice off one without the other. So when we say accountable to each other, well, you will to think it in terms of the fifth uh, the fifth principles. Yes, you have the right of conscience, but at the same time, there is a democratic process. So that's how I would answer that objection. Okay, Dick was next. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on what 
Karen and um, Willie just said. To me, the one thing that's missing from the wording uh, Finley is, is world community is one phrase that's missing. Another phrase is democracy. So I'd like to see uh, democratic accountability to the world community, not, not just to each other, but and not just accountability, democratic accountability to the world community. Because that's what's missing. Those, uh, the world community and democracy are both missing from the current proposed eighth principle and also from your, your larger wording. My response would be that this is a call to action and we have a sixth principle that already encompasses world community and we have a fifth principle that encompasses democracy. Uh, this is designed to say, look, if we're going to fight racism within our uh, cells and in our institutions. So the, the call to action is pointed toward Unitarian Universalists. We're saying we're, we already have our sixth principle, the world community, liberty and justice for all, we have our fifth principle, which deals very clearly with the democratic tension between individual conscience. But if we're going to fight racism as a specific enemy of human progress, uh, we must focus on the organization that was created as a non creedal church, as described by one of our ancestors, that we want to say within our creedal system, which is non creedal there is a particular focus for this call to action. That's why I like to see it, not as a principle, but simply a call to action, aim for you use, because we're the ones that are the target for this uh, disruptive uh, neo-racist uh, struggle. So that's how I would answer that. Okay, uh, Joyce Francis was next. <clears throat> I guess I wanna just echo Karen that, that I think of our, uh, accountability is in terms of our behavior to one another. Our covenant is in terms of our behavior to one another. Uh, but I don't see that we have a covenant or a call to action or an accountability to one another to um, take action in the world. Um, and so this feels to me like uh, we're still accountable to one another to, to march, to, um, you know, take whatever actions are listed in the uh, current widening the circle. Uh, are we accountable to one another for those taking those actions? And are we going to be judged by our colleagues, our friends, our fellow congregants, because we didn't show up at the March. Uh, well, we are looking at uh, Kelvin. If you can want to jump in, but you will. Uh, that's why we add the word multiracial. We're in, we're arguing that we have very specific accountability is dismantling racism. Nothing else. If the if COIC uses the word multiracial, then we should support it. If they do not use the word multiracial, we will we'll oppose it. Our, our vision is that in these various congregations, if they accept this call to action in the fight against racism, which is seen as the primary contradiction that is facing us today, whether you look at it from an international, national, or local perspective, this race thing is artificially created, but deliberately produced. Therefore, you and I would talk about, well, you don't want to go to the demonstration. Well, I'm going to the demonstration. Can you at least raise money for the bond in case I go to jail. So now you and I are entered into an accountability relationship, not some abstract group coming in from the outside or the inside, but it's me and you. Uh, we're ready to walk out to the demonstration. You decided not to go because you have a right of conscience, but you will support the process to help me to get out of jail. So that's how your accountability comes, comes into play. But are we not each accountable to our own conscience for the, the the choices we make about how to go about this. Well, there we go. What is conscience? Mm -hmm. So let me ask you. Freud says our conscience is pretty fragile. Our conscience is based upon subconscious motivations, traumas in our childhood. Uh, he had a whole elaborate analysis of the fact that our unconscious minds are often more powerful than our conscious mind. 
That's why you got to have some kind of collective way to make sure that your conscience is not calling you to do something that might be negative, but it sounds like it's really, really powerful to you. So we got to be careful we don't make individualism a primary aspect of unitary universalism. That's been our contradiction. Okay, let's go with David uh, next. Um, uh, two things. I, I noticed the, the mention of our uh, place in the universe. And I'm not sure we know what that is. Um, for a while, I was confused. Like, were we coveting to accept little green men from some planet when we find them? Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. I'm just thinking we might have reached a little too far. And if we were trying to shorten it up, we, we might start there. Um, the other thing, I'm still having an, uh, a problem understanding accountability. Uh, and, and not just within UUism, but uh, that, that word accountability is being used all over the world. It's like a current buzzword. And, uh, you know, is Putin going to be accountable for Ukraine? Like, it's meaningless in so many ways. Um, and I'm not, as far as I know, uh, covenanted to be accountable for any of the seven principles. So I'm not sure how we can suddenly make us accountable for one or two things. Um, well, e even if we wish everybody was accountable. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, the fight against racism is a very precise and specific form. I was listening to it a very, uh, I listened to Chris Hedges over a forbidden radio station. I kind of mentioned it on the air. We'll make it stop by the CIA. And he speaks about the fact that the fight against racism We've always won, and they always got to come with a new game to keep us from figuring out we won. We always win. We have always won the fight against racism, and then the federal government comes in from behind the scenes, usually a minority of some sort, like in 1896, and they sabotage the efforts to uh, create the uh, fully just society based on racial equality. So how do we get around the fact that the state will constantly intervene to prevent us from solving the problem? We were on our way to full racial integration after 1965, and then the Hoover, the Hoover crowd brought out the black power, their black power agents, and they wrecked that. And then they intervened in our own church system with the black empowerment of a neo-racist attack. We did, <laughs> and one of the chief leaders of that attack, Mr. Sinkford, ended up becoming the president. So we're faced with some really bad forces here. If you don't have some kind of accountability structure, now in Marxist Leninist thought, it's called democratic centralism. We argue, we debate, but once we make the decision we're gonna go forward, then we go forward together. And we are accountable, not to some mysterious ego that can go this way or that, but we've made a decision. We're gonna walk and step together. It's like when you get ready to take a march to Portland or to, in this place, Spokane, and set up churches there. You can't have people just going out any this way or that way because of this, that, and the other. So accountability, I'm sorry that the word got ruined, it's still a vital concept. It means to be counted. Can I count on you? That's what accountability means to me. Like I say with Sister Francis, I'm getting ready to go out to the march. You don't want to go to the march, but can I count on you to pay the, help pay the bond? Well, your conscious says, well, I can't, I can't do that. I can't help you pay the bond. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's no longer lo logically moral. It becomes immoral. Your conscience then becomes a force of immorality because it wouldn't allow you to take part. So I account myself in the fight against racism to respect your opinions and beliefs so long as our ultimate goal is dismantling is what we believe in. Now, we, if your conscience says, well, I don't believe we should dismantle racism, I think it's a part of humanity, then we have a big disagreement. But that's how it answers that question. Okay, let's what go to uh... held accountable um, to give my wealth to the poor in order to fight economic oppression? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be kind of uh, sharp. We're here to fight racism. Poverty is based on racism, whether it's a white, black, or brown poor person. I'm here in Spokane, Washington, yeah. and my brother took me around. We're just driving down the street. There's all these poor people. They got things on their heads. They're sitting in a corner. They're walking across the street. What's holding back 
the economic program that Johnson came up with back in 1965. Racism. Racism. There's no way to get rid of all this stuff till we fight racism. Understand what does what does our statement say again? Our proposal does it does it include only racism or does it include other oppressions? It also includes other oppressions, but without the dismantling of racism, all the other oppressions will remain in place. Okay, well let's let's move on to uh, Michael Johnson next. I think I probably need to move closer to be heard. So this this is often in, in a different direction. It it seems to me. The, the, the centerpiece of the proposed eighth principle is really a mission statement and not a principle on par with the other seven principles right. and potentially does violence to the other seven principles. So I suggest in this statement there be inclusion that whatever is enacted in the, in the spirit of this proposed principle be um, congruent with the other seven principles. That's why we say very clearly, quote, uh, which I can't read right now, but it says something. Oh, yeah. Committed to the seven principles. Since this is going to be a call to action, then the seven principles are the, is the frame. And this has been uh, the UEAC position. This is the UEAC position. I cannot speak for all Unitarian Universalists. But for the UEAC folks, the seven principles are fundamental. So I agree with Brother Johnson on that one. Okay, uh, Jim Anderson's next. Hi, um, I uh, have been to many meetings over the years with UUs, and I've always been impressed with how much time they spend on language. And we're very wordy people. Um, I've, I have kind of come to the uh, conclusion that we have too many principles as it is. I think if we actually practice the first principle, we wouldn't need anything else. There's a difference between theory and practice. And I think um, the inherent worth and dignity uh, that if I see everybody as possessing inherent worth and dignity, then that eliminates racism. Um, and, and, and it also implies all of the other principles, except maybe the seventh, maybe I would add, um, we covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of all sentient beings. And, and that would be good enough for me if I could observe it being practiced. But my observations over many years in not just UU places, but humans is that there's a vast gulf between theory and practice. So I would like to see, huh, uh, maybe an, an acknowledgement that the principles are aspirational, things we're trying to do and a real commitment to practice the first principle in seeing my own inherent work and dignity and seeing everybody else's. So that's, I think we have too many principles as it is. <laughs> I appreciate that. The, uh, this is like uh, the golden rule concept. Uh, uh, we, 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 everybody just followed the golden rule that all of the things that happen, or as one theologian said, you have the golden rule and the rest of it is interpretation and commentary. So we got number one and the other six are ex extension, commentary, and organizational principles. I like all seven. I think we should treat them as, 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 as my, my personal creed. I, I see it as, I, I see creed, a creed, there are two kinds of creeds, one that I am forced to believe and one that I love to believe. So I love to believe in my, my seven principles and the so-called eighth principle is designed to destroy the other seven. Uh, so whether you just want one or whether you want seven, one thing is for sure, the main enemy is the proposed eighth principle. That's why we say we got our version is not a principle. It is a call to action, which is a UMIAC version of how we fight for racism. Now, that's how I want you to see this. It is not designed to you as a Unitarian Universalist with your own faith system, your own religious orientation. Remember, we're the big wide tent, but inside that tent, the UMIAC vision Racism is the big enemy. And if we want to come up with something that would try to bring in the honest supporters, the honest supporters of the proposed eighth principle, because they really want to do some fight, we say this is a better way to do it, but we can't have it as a principle. It can only be a call to action, which individuals decide 
whether they want to fuck, call, answer that call or not. So that's that's how we see it. Okay, we well, got Molly uh, Brady next. I, I'd like <laughs> I'd like to point out that we've we've uh, come to what we said would be the end of this session, but so so maybe we could have two more. Yeah, I would go with Molly and David. Uh, Karen has spoke once already, so maybe after those two, uh, yeah. we could. Uh, and then can we have Kelvin to sum up? The, the, the discussion, if that's okay, after everybody has to speak. Yeah, we can always trim the musical interlude a little bit. Okay, then Kelvin brings it to an end, and then we go to the musical interlude. Okay, okay let's go for it. Uh, Molly, go ahead. Okay, thank you for letting me speak. Um, I'd like to just respond from a newcomer, relatively very, very much a newcomer to UU. I, uh, I joined the church and really didn't know a whole lot about it, before 2017, and I joined in 2017. So from that perspective, one of the things that really attracted me and immediately captured me was were the seven principles. And one of the things that was so great about them, first of all, was that they were they were very simple, very easy to understand, and they and they spoke to me. I didn't have to I didn't have to question the wording. I didn't have to struggle to understand, which the proposed eighth principle, I, when I first heard it, I just, I, I couldn't understand it, okay? And so I was very glad to hear, Finley, you say that this is not a principle. This is a call to action. I think it, and all of us here seem to be a little bit confused about that because I hear people saying, well, this, we have to change it to make it simple like the others. And that would be true if we were going to make it a principle. It, it just doesn't work. It is confusing. We do put a lot, of, I couldn't agree more. We tend to put a lot of words out there when we're talking about everything, Finley, you're just as bad as the rest of us. And that you, you explain, we all do. We're all a bunch of wannabe, you know, intellectual snobs or something. I, and I don't want to insult anybody, but you know, we really do talk things. In, in a very complicated way. And we have, I, I, I just think all people have complicated minds and love talking that way and love getting involved. There's not anybody I've met that doesn't like to really delve into things. So with all that said, um, I think we still need to simplify it if it's a call to action. Um, just as demonstrated by the way we're talking about it among us ourselves now, we're all struggling to understand it in terms of things that we understand or knowledge that we have about history. And it, and it, and it shouldn't take a history class to put us together on the call. What is the call? So if we can make it simpler, it would be great. I think on the accountability thing, and I just want, this has nothing to do with what I just said. I, I think we still need to simplify it. But on the accountability thing, it's funny because I've talked with people when I, since I came into the church um, about accountability, and I kind of came to my own conclusions without looking at historic discussion about it, that yes, there's conscious, my own conscious, but I always figure that we're not real good judges of ourselves. Um, we tend to put ourselves up on this pedestal. We're a little bit, I'm talking about everybody personally. We kind of think we're better than, you know, we do things right. <laughs> We're not good judges. And so what I do and what I use for accountability, and it's um, kind of in our autonomous, our autonomous congregation among that beloved community, which is quite small, um, I take it upon myself to be, uh, I call people out. If I think they're not, a, not practicing <clears throat> the first principle, I feel I'm under an obligation to step in there. If somebody is being treated, it's just like the thing they say about bullies. If somebody's bullying somebody, if they're, you know, they're using their power to overcome them and and insult them and 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 degrade them, well, that's my responsibility is to step in and stop it and to call them out. So somewhat I look at that as sort of a, a collective responsibility that we have within our smaller community because we can't be calling out 
we're, the eighth principle accountability is that we're going to have some anonymous group come in that's self-selected and they're going to come into my beloved community, <laughs> which is my, the way I define it. And they're going to tell me you're bad and we're going to do this and you're going to be accountable and we're going to have these consequences. And I, that's sort of how I look at it, just as a side. But the call to action, um, I really appreciate it, Finley. You really tried to, to pull together um, what the concepts that are in the eighth principle and modify them so they're more reasonable and clear. But um, I still think it needs to be simplified. So Thank you. newcomers like me could come in, look at it and say, yep, that's what we should do. I want to be part of that. I want to answer that call, you know? Okay. All right. Thank, so. you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Now, David Fentress. Okay. Um, so kind of echoing what other folks have said about um, principles versus plan of action. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, it strikes me that the seven existing principles do what a principle of a religion should do. It's uh, something that's eternally meaningful and timeless and will be true 5,000 years from now, just as it is now, whereas the proposed eighth principle sounds more like a contemporary response to a contemporary problem. And so, uh, yes, it should not be a principle. But uh, for the um, whatever alternative wording we want to have, this is kind of a fine point, but I think I would probably suggest avoiding use of the word multicultural. In its ostensible, pure meaning, it's fine. It would mean, you know, equal respect and inclusion for all cultures. But unfortunately, I think in contemporary society, it's it has some sort of ide ideological connotations um, that might be sort of a trigger for some folks. Like, uh, uh, say, someone who is maybe slightly right of center, but an open-minded person, and someone like that should certainly feel welcome in a UU church. They may, as soon as they see the word multicultural, they're going to go, "Oh," and maybe not, not be so warm up to us so much. Just my thought. A great thought. Great thought. Thank you. Okay, well, we, we had said earlier that after Molly and David, we were going to end this part. So I, I know Carol's got her hand up, but she wasn't in line when we said that we were going to go that. So I'll leave it over to you, uh, Richard. You're the overall moderator. Uh, but we do and have Kelvin, last word, please, if possible. Okay. Kelvin. Well, Kelvin. thank you all so much. And thank you for listening. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> we all are accountable to each other in this fight against racism. And even if you think that Dr. Campbell and I are compromising on our fight against racism, it's up to you to put us back on our feet and put us back in the direction that we should go. This is the way we ought to be in order to make this change, staying on that track and making sure that we can actually find that day when we can say racism has ended. It'd be a change to society, but what a greater change it would be when we all can actually live free together. Thank you so much. Amen. When we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Back to you, Richard. Well, I, now, um, what would be scheduled would be uh, a musical interlude with uh, Leah. And Leah, now's your chance to tell us who you are. <laughs> Now, are you sure? Because you just said shorten the musical interlude. You sure you want to add a bio now? Oh, yeah, because we have lost one of our speakers. We, we've lost one of our speakers, so we have all this extra time here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the tricky Tell part is I wasn't. What? Tell your story, girl. Okay, I wasn't set up, so I have to pull it up. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Somebody wrote up. Uh, Roger Rochester for my 50th birthday wrote a little ode for me and so I've cut that a friend of mine cut that into a bio for me so here we go to meet Leah is to meet presence wrapped in bright fabric sometimes flamboyant never dull she was an accomplished singer musician speaker teacher worship leader with a voice sometimes rolling and deep sometimes light and soaring as wide as a river and powerful enough to lift a room full of human spirit. 
She has the innate sense to recognize the wonder in a child's eyes and the ability to spin a tail right on the spot. Leah has taught so many and inspired thousands in dance, music, cantoral liturgy, and her energy will resonate on through time in the families and children and children of children in the classes, lessons, bar mitzvahs, weddings, baptisms, funerals of sisters and brothers she has been blessed, honored, and jazzed to walk with in this life. Her love for food, music, dance, and theater, and cultures of all kinds has been inexhaustible. And actually, I was going to begin with, I don't need that anymore, so that can go away, and I can come back and join you. Um, and I meant to join that with, that with the fact that I'm a cradle Unitarian, having trouble with my setup here. Okay, I'm a cradle Unitarian and uh, I was brought into this world by Polly McCoo, who joined the first Unitarian Church in Chicago when she was 19 years old. And uh, she was a teacher there. And I, even as a, as a teenager, was a teacher there. And um, I grew up through the Chicago Children's Choir and uh, finally left there and went to college and immediately ran to the Unitarian Church in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and was not welcomed there. Okay, so I am now here and I am ready to sing this song, which was actually, um, um, oh, I forgot what you call it when somebody, requisite, requisition? I'm losing the word. But anyway, Marlene Walker, Dr. Marlene Walker, asked me to find a way to take the seven principles of uh, the Unitarian seven principles and put it in a way that kids could actually grab a hold of it and understand it. Because as you know, we Unitarians are very glib or very, <laughs> we stretch things out a bit. So I tried to hone it down into a recognizable melody. I think I did this overnight. So. It is a call and response of sorts. Should you decide to accept it, feel free. I'll give you your parts. If I say, people grow, love and live free. Your answer would be, how can we live free? Go ahead, I'll give you a chance to try it. How, how can we live free? And don't forget, Alan, to mute yourself. Okay. Will you respect <laughs> the value of all beings? And then you're gonna say, We'll respect the value of all beings. We'll respect the value of all mm. beings mm. and grow and know that all are welcome here. Try that. And grow oh, and know oh, that all oh, are welcome oh, here. And don't forget to mute yourself. <laughs> People grow, love, and live free. How can we live free? Will you respect the value of all beings? We'll respect the value of all beings and grow and know that all are welcome here. People grow, love, and live free. How shall we live free? Will you offer kind fair ways to all? <coughs> we'll offer kind fair ways to all and grow and know that all are welcome here. People grow, love, and live free. How shall we live free? Will you yearn to learn throughout your lives? We'll yearn to learn throughout our lives and grow and know that all are welcome here. People grow, love, and live free. How shall we live? Will you grow together by exploring ideas? We'll grow together by exploring ideas and grow and know that all are welcome here. People grow, love, and live free. How shall we live free? Will you insist on doing GB? Will you believe and act on your ideas? We'll believe and act on our ideas and grow and know that all are welcome here. People grow, love, and live free. How shall we live free? Will you insist on justice and peace for all? We'll insist on justice and peace for all and grow and know that all are welcome here. People grow, love, and live free. How shall we live free? Will you value your place in the web of all things that are or have been? And you can just say, we will. We will. And grow and know 
that all are welcome here. Now, is that a good place to stop? Um, what do you think, Alan? Well, is it lunchtime yet? Well. No. Uh, no. I think it's, it, it's, it's, it, it's it, well, is Todd and Craig ready? Yes. Well, we just go right to them because they can give us some extra time because they're going to be going deep. Yeah. 